Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started. In Alzheimer's disease, there's a hypothesis that's given credibility by many neurologists about the plaque buildup in the brain. There's been evolving science indicating that infectious organisms are causative of Alzheimer's disease. And now there's a merging of the two hypotheses. So welcome to our episode, Can You Catch Alzheimer's Disease? Well, it's not so straightforward and so simple. Hi, my name is Jerry Hickey. I'm a nutritional pharmacist. I'm also the chief scientific officer over here at Invite Health. And when it comes to nutrition, we have a whole group of people that are making their life better. In any event, let's go to a very important report. The reason I'm doing this podcast in the first place, back in the 1990s, I saw studies reporting um, evidence that herpes viruses and other viruses were implicated in causing Alzheimer's disease, triggering Alzheimer's disease. And a report came out in Nature, that's a great, that's a great journal, um, on uh, November 4th of this year, are infections seeding some cases of Alzheimer's disease. So it's a very interesting link, and it seems to have legs. So here's the Journal of Alzheimer's disease. This is a very important manuscript. It's, uh, It's called Microbes and Alzheimer's disease. And there's many major academic research institutions involved. The University of Oxford, Imperial College of London, the University of Texas at San Antonio, there's College of Sciences, NYU College of Dentistry, Wayne State University School of Medicine. I want to give you some of these be- to, just to let you know it is serious. It's a serious publication. Queen's College in Cambridge, University of New Mexico Health Science Center, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, Oregon Health and Sciences University, University of Manchester, University of Edinburgh, and there's about 20 or 30 other academic research institutions involved in this. And you have to listen to how this starts. We are researchers and clinicians working on Alzheimer's disease or related topics. And we write to express our concern that one particular aspect of the disease has been neglected, even though treatment based on it might slow or arrest Alzheimer's disease progression. We refer to the many studies, mainly on humans, implicating specific microbes in the elderly brain, notably herpes simplex virus type 1, chlamydia pneumonia, and several types of spirochete. Now, spirochetes cause Um, Lyme's disease, that would be an example of what they cause, and the etiology of Alzheimer's disease, you know, the causation of Alzheimer's disease. Fungal infections of Alzheimer's disease brains have also been described, as well as abnormal microbiota in the Alzheimer's disease patient's blood. So let's explain that so far. So they're saying that there's infections getting into the brain of elderly people, which is interesting because older people, well, interesting and scary, older people develop leakiness of their blood-brain barrier. So let's discuss that for a minute because that kind of is part of this whole scenario. Uh, The blood-brain barrier is um, extra insulation on the blood vessels in the brain. Don't forget, all your blood vessels are connected. So the blood that goes through your feet and through your heart also goes through your brain. You don't want the wrong thing leaving that blood and entering the brain. That could be very dangerous. So one one of the aspects of Alzheimer's that's being... um, really interestingly uh, researched is um, leaky blood-brain barriers in elderly people. Um, The major component of the blood-brain barrier is collagen, and and older people make a lot less collagen. So there is something to that. A second way of looking at this is infections in the mouth or gums or lips, and these can work their way into the brain indirectly. And a third way is an imbalance of bacteria in the intestines, which is one of the things they allude to Uh, when they talk about uh, abnormal microbiota in Alzheimer's disease patients' blood. So they go on to say the first observations of HSV-1 in Alzheimer's disease brains were reported almost three decades ago. It's true. I saw this this in the early 1990s, a number of reports. They were finding 
genetic evidence that people with Alzheimer's had infections in their brain. They couldn't locate the, the infection, that's hard to do, but they could get their genes in there. The ever-increasing number of these studies. Now, this is in 2017. Excuse me, 2016. This is in 2016. And at that point, already just on HSV1, that's the human... Um, uh, the herpes simplex that that you get on your, your lips, HSV-1. At that point, there was already about 100 papers on HSV-1 by 2016, by the year 2016, being causative or somehow implicated in Alzheimer's disease. So they said, uh, now about 100 studies on HSV-1 alone, that's the herpes virus on your dope, warrants reevaluation of the infection and Alzheimer's disease concept. So they go on to say, and I, I'm cherry-picking words here because it's very long and it's very complex, this paper. Hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, uh, we suggest, are indicators of an infectious etiology, meaning an infection cause everything that an infection causes, you also see in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient. Um, but what they're saying, and I'm going to um, um, translate this, <laughs> that... Certain microbes that get into your brain cause an infection, but they could remain latent for many decades, and then they can reactivate when your immune system weakens. That's exactly what they're saying here. I'm paraphrasing dramatically. So here they list evidence for an infectious immune system component. Viruses and other microbes are present in the brain of most elderly people, although usually dormant. So they have them in their brain, they got into their brain somehow, either through like like uh, severe gum disease or, or some other way, maybe through the nose. Uh, reactivation can occur after stress and immunosuppression. Because older people, they go through immunosenescence, an age-associated decline in immune system function. So that they're saying here, as we develop immunosenescence, we, me, we meaning me because I'm already 66, that these uh, viruses and bacteria could become reactivated. They're not being kept in check by the immune system anymore. So now they go on to the second step of evidence for an infection as a component of Alzheimer's disease. Herpes simplex encephalitis produces damage in localized regions associated with memory, cognitive function, and affective processes, as well as personality, just like you see in Alzheimer's disease patients, in other words. Now, number three, in the brain of Alzheimer's disease patients, pathogen signatures, like, like herpes 1, specifically specifically co-localize with Alzheimer's disease pathology. So they're saying that and the places where you see the damage from Alzheimer's disease, like in the entorhinal cortex, an important part of the brain that's kind of like your GPS, your internal GPS, that they'll see evidence that there's an infection in that part of the brain where, there, where there's damage. So that's, now it's becoming scary. Uh, number four, um, herpes simplex virus infection, as revealed by seropositivity, so a blood test, is significantly associated with the development of Alzheimer's disease. So they see frequently people have herpes infections and they also have Alzheimer's disease. I think it's probably more complex than that. There's probably also a genetic factor involved here. We'll talk about the Apple E4, E4 gene in a little while. Alzheimer's disease has long been known to have a prominent inflammatory component characteristic of infection. That's just step five. Step six, Oh, yeah, the gene. Polymorphisms in the apolipoprotein E gene, ApoE, that modulate immune function and susceptibility to infections also govern as Alzheimer's disease risk. Okay, so we have an ApoE gene, and there's different variants of it. There's ApoE2 that's thought to be protective, although that remains to be seen because not all studies show that. There's ApoE3 that a lot of people have that's kind of like not protective, but not dangerous. And then there's ApoE4. And these genes are involved with carrying cholesterol, uh, but they're also involved with um, inflammation in the brain. So people with the ApoE4 gene, if they get a copy of that gene from each parent, uh, they have a higher risk of heart disease, but they also have a much higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Doesn't mean that risk is written in stone. If they exercise, they eat a good diet, they do a lot of reading, uh, they're well-educated, um, they avoid certain things like smoking, they can avoid Alzheimer's disease. So even with the gene potential ApoE4 gene, uh, there's still ways to help protect yourself, like drinking green tea, 
having cocoa, eating your broccoli, all these things are important. Now, feature seven. Features of Alzheimer's disease pathology, the damage that is, are transmissible by inoculation from an Alzheimer's disease brain to primates and mice. Now, that's really scary. And that's why I say, can you catch Alzheimer's disease? They're saying that if you take damage in the brain of an Alzheimer's disease patient, damaged tissue, and you inoculate that into a chimpanzee, they will catch Alzheimer's. I read a a report from a neurologist about a year ago. I spent about an hour today before I did this episode looking for it. And what she said is um, she believed that there was an infectious component to Alzheimer's disease. Now, this was not a study. It was kind of like an open letter. She believed that there was an infectious component to Alzheimer's disease because she said the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is much higher in neurologists who treat patients with Alzheimer's. So who do surgery, who do surgery on patients with Alzheimer's. So that's a very interesting letter. I couldn't find it. Wish I could. So here's evidence for causation, and I'll translate as we go. I'll paraphrase and translate. In humans, brain infections by HIV, herpes virus, and measles is known to be associated with Alzheimer's disease like pathology. So those infections, if it gets into the brain, they cause damage that looks like Alzheimer's disease. In mice and in cell cultures, uh, um, A beta deposition and tau abnormalities typical of Alzheimer's disease are observed after infections with HSV-1 or bacteria. So let me just explain. There's sort of a, uh, uh, a train wreck of events that leads to Alzheimer's. Somehow inflammation is getting into the brain. Whatever's causing it, I'm sure there's different causes. Okay. Something is getting into the brain and causing inflammation somehow whether it's leaky blood vessels leading to the brain, the blood-brain barrier, or gum disease bacteria getting into the brain, or viruses getting into the brain through the nose, whatever it is, there's something going on there. Um, When the inflammation gets into the brain, the brain swells, and it's no longer capable of breaking down beta amyloid, a plaque. It's also called A-beta. And this beta amyloid is actually a protein the beta amyloid then congeals into a plaque that becomes toxic, highly unstable toxic. That in turn damages the nerves and you get tauopathies and that's like when the brain is really gone from Alzheimer's disease. So what they're saying is in in mice, when when you have an infection with herpes virus or bacteria, they develop the beta amyloid plaque buildup and then they develop the damage to the nerves, which we call tau- tauopathies or tau abnormalities. But here's something really interesting. Step three, evidence for causation. So they're looking at, do infections cause Alzheimer's disease? This one is really interesting. Olfactory dysfunction is an early symptom of Alzheimer's disease. That means you can't smell things. You can't recognize things by their smell. Olfactory dis- dysfunction is an early symptom of Alzheimer's disease. The olfactory nerve, which leads to the lateral entorhinal cortex, that's a part of the brain that where it seems Alzheimer's really starts out. The entorhinal cortex interacts with your... Um, Uh, dentate gyrus, which is right next to your hippocampus and the hippocampus itself. And they kind of tell you where you are in uh, relationship to the world and what you're doing and if you're standing or sitting and uh, problem solving and memory and logic and all those things come out of a combination of interactions between those three organs. They're very important for your memory. So they're saying the olfactory nerve, that's the nerve for smelling things, leads to the Entorhinal cortex, that's the initial site from where Alzheimer's disease pathology spreads through the brain. So that's where Alzheimer's disease likely starts in the brain. Is a likely portal of entry of herpes virus 1 and other viruses, as well as chlamydia and pneumonia, into the brain. So they're saying when you have a, a, a herpes on your lip, um, it gets into your olfactory nerve, and that's when you stop smelling things because it's getting inflamed and damaged. And then from there, it can get into your entorhinal cortex, which is involved with memory and and cognitive functions, and especially your GPS, knowing where you are and if you're sitting, standing, etc. And that's where the pathology of Alzheimer's seems to start from and spread throughout the brain. So this is very interesting. And these are top-notch academic research institutions. 
So here's the study that prompted me to do this. It's from Nature. Are infections seeding some cases of Alzheimer's disease? So they said, a fringe theory links microbes in the brain with the onset of dementia. Now researchers are taking it seriously. So let's go through this. Two years, here's how they start the uh, article. Two years ago, an immunologist and medical publishing entrepreneur named Leslie Norens offered to award $1 million of his own money to any scientist who could prove that Alzheimer's disease was caused by a germ. So here's the thing. A lot of neurologists feel that there can be an infectious component to Alzheimer's disease, where other neurologists say, well, no, it's not that, it's a buildup of plaque. Well, why can't it be both? Why can't one lead to the other? And that's exactly what they're leading to in this article that came out this month in the journal Nature. So they want to say recent research has provided intriguing hints that the two ideas could fit together, that infection could seed some cases of Alzheimer's disease by triggering the production of amyloid clumps. That's that, the, the beta amyloid plaque that I was talking about. Discuss Ruth Ijaki, a biophysicist at the University of Manchester in England, who reported observations of herpes simplex virus, the one you get on your lip, type 1, and postmortem Alzheimer's brains in the 1990s. That was the original studies I was reading. She thinks that the presence of microbes in the brain must indicate a role for them, and she and she and others think that they have good evidence that viruses are a linchpin in Alzheimer's. So she goes on to say, most of us always acknowledge that amyloid was a very important feature of Alzheimer's, but it is just not the cause, she says. So there's something else that's causing it. Because mm. you can have amyloid plaque in the brain and not develop Alzheimer's. There's, there's another theory called cognitive reserve. It goes back to the nuns' health study in the 1990s. These nuns were very active. They were very social. They were eating properly, etc. They didn't smoke. They didn't drink. They went to bed on time. And when they, uh, about 100 of them donated their brains to science, and post-mortem, they found that some of these nuns had all the evidence of Alzheimer's disease, but they never developed it. Because the way they lived, the way they lived, the way they lived built new tissue in their brain, new memory cells. This can happen. We, we have nerve growth factors like brain-derived neurotrophic factor that when we go to sleep at night, we create new memory cells that are not tainted by any damage. They're new and healthy. They're not tainted by depression and not tainted by Alzheimer's plaques. And if you develop a new of these healthy brain cells, you have cognitive reserve and you're kind of like saying, well, yeah, okay, so there's some damage in part of my brain, but I still have enough brain left over to go on functioning because it's brand new baby brain. So they go on to say several microbes have been proposed as triggers of Alzheimer's disease, including three human herpes viruses and three bacteria, chlamydia pneumonia, a cause of lung infections, Borrelia burgdorferi, that's Lyme's disease, and most recently Porphyromonas gingivalis. And most recently Porphyromonas gingivalis, that's gum disease. So in theory, these can get into the brain and trigger the buildup of the plaque and the damage to the nerves that's called autoopathy. So they said two attention-grabbing papers in 2018 examined the role of herpes viruses. One from a group led by Joel Dudley. That, this was local. This was at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in Manhattan. And it was about a 1,000 post-mortem brains. And they concluded that levels of human herpes virus 6A HHV 6A, and human herpes virus 7 were higher in people who had Alzheimer's disease than in controls. Now, other researchers at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke and Bethesda, Maryland, they couldn't replicate these findings. But here, a decade-long study in Taiwan followed more than 8,000 people who were diagnosed with herpes simplex virus, that's the one people get on their lip, and compared them with a controlled group of 25,000 people who did not have herpes simplex virus. The group of people with herpes had a 2,000, excuse me, a 250-fold increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. They had a 250% increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But if they treated aggressively the virus with the antiviral drugs, it eliminated, it eliminated their risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. I mean, that's pretty strong. Okay, I think what we're going to do now is end this, and I'll continue uh, on a second part of this episode. Because I'd like to tell you, if, if you have 
some viruses. People can have uh, chronic viruses like herpes viruses. There are things you could do to help protect your brain. So we'll talk about that in part two of this episode, along with a couple of other studies. So thank you for tuning into the Invite Health Podcast. You can find all of our episodes for free wherever you listen to podcasts, or you could just visit invitehealth.com, and right on our loading page, you'll see an icon for podcasts and also our radio shows. Please make sure you subscribe. Please leave us a review. I'd like to know how I'm doing. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Invite Health. Hope to see you another time on another episode of the Invite Health Podcast, especially part two of this episode, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you.